Well, I, uh, I learned a little something during the announcements this morning. You can get up in the morning and you can drink your chai tea and then you can go out and do Tai Chi. Just, <laughs> wow, it's amazing how that works. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> well, speaking of funny, last month a kind of funny thing happened in North Carolina, specifically in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Actually, if you think this kind of thing is funny, really, it's, it's, it's not so funny. It's for real, maybe even a bit alarming. The State House in North Carolina drafted a bill that was designed to pave the way to establish Christianity as the official state religion. Anybody hear about this? It's, it, was, it was for real. Fortunately, the bill was stopped before it even got to a vote, but the fact that it was even proposed is a disturbing <coughs> political development. I mean, imagine if you were Jewish or Buddhist, lived in North Carolina, saw that law being advanced, how would you feel? You know, I don't think a law like that would ever stand a, a, a chance of being passed, or if it was passed, I don't think it would stand a chance of being upheld, but that doesn't stop people from, uh, what is it they say, running it up the flagpole, you know, and, and seeing who salutes, that kind of a thing. In fact, the other thing about this headline that's kind of disturbing is that there was a recent poll that says one-third of Americans want Christianity as the officially recognized religion. I'll tell you, you know, that, that's, a, that's something to think about, a third of the population. And the reason I bring this up today is because this is pluralism Sunday. For the past few years now, the Center for Progressive Christianity has designated the first Sunday in May as Pluralism Sunday, celebrating the many paths to God. Celebrating the many paths to God. And I added that piece about praise well with others because I thought it was clever. I kind of like that. But, uh, <laughs> This is Pluralism Sunday. This is something that's really in alignment with our core values and unity. What is it that we say here? We say, one God and many, many paths. That's right. So um, this is how they define pluralism at the Center for Progressive Christianity. Pluralism is the idea that my religion is good for me, and your religion may turn out to be as good for you as mine is for me. So, pluralism is the concept that there are multiple loci of truth and salvation among the religions. Now, pluralism does not imply that all religions are the same or that all religions are equal, but it does recognize the possibility that my way is not the only way and that my religion is not necessarily superior to yours. That's the starting point right there. That's from a fellow named Jim Burklow. He's a minister with the uh, Center for Progressive Christianity. And, and a very important part of that definition that I want to stress here this morning is the part that says that pluralism does not imply that all religions are the same or that all religions are equal. When we say one God and many paths, we're not suggesting that all paths should be regarded as valid. For example, an Islamic extremist may believe that martyrdom and jihad is a path to God, but we do not have to honor, validate, or accept that. On the other hand, how many people do you know who lump all of Islam into the extremist category and then reject any expression of the Islamic faith. That's not right either. Every religion has a shadow side. Every religion has violent extremists. We don't have to validate or accept the shadow side. And one of the best things about living in this country with our, our radical declaration of freedom and equality is we have the freedom to pursue any spiritual path that we choose. Before the United States came to be, there was a time when religious authorities in the world controlled everything, including the way you were supposed to think. They controlled your speech. They controlled the kind of books that could be written. 
and things like that. Free thinkers were known as heretics. They burned them at the stake or other things. That's one of the reasons why I really take notice when I hear something on the news or see a letter to the editor talking about how America is a Christian nation. Okay, religion has always been, been woven into the fabric of American politics and culture, but I challenge anyone to find the words Jesus or Christian in the Declaration of Independence or the United States Constitution or the Bill of Rights. They're not there. The word God is completely absent from the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence speaks only of things like the laws of nature and of nature's God and a creator. These are the references that you find. This is as close as you come to anything about God in any of our founding documents. The laws of nature and of nature's God, it uses the word creator, it talks about the supreme judge, and also divine providence. That's it. No Jesus, no Christian. I mean, this, is, this is not what you would call a ringing endorsement of religion in general or Christianity in particular. And I find that it's an interesting and very deliberate use of words. The laws of nature and God are given equal status in this document. At best, we can say the founders acknowledged a creator, they acknowledged a source of good, and they acknowledged the existence of natural law. Again, a cautious and deliberate use of language. And the reason that our founders were, were so cautious is because of something that I never learned when I was uh, uh, being taught history in grade school. They never taught me about how some of the American colonies actually had their own official religion. And it was a disaster. For example, colonial Massachusetts. That's where the Puritans were the ruling group. It was illegal to be anything else. And it was especially bad to be a Quaker. They executed people for being Quakers, including a woman by the name of Mary Dyer. And you know why? Because those, 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 those darn Quakers, they had the audacity to, to suggest and to teach that God was directly accessible to everyone. No priest, no middleman, no clergy was needed. Plus, to make matters even worse, you know, those Quakers are, are pacifists. <laughs> you, you can't count on them to get violent when you need them to be, right? So, <laughs> bad stuff, man. And it wasn't just Massachusetts. Every colony had its own special target group. In Virginia, they persecuted Baptists and Presbyterians. In Maryland, Catholics couldn't vote, or hold public office, or worship publicly. Now, don't, don't you find it a little strange that religious groups came to this continent to find religious freedom for themselves so they could deny that same freedom to everyone else? I mean, human beings are, we're strange creatures sometimes, I'll tell you. <laughs> Rhode Island, though, was one of the really bright lights in colonial times. Rhode Island was founded by a fellow named Roger Williams, who, uh, to his credit, was kicked out of the Puritan colony of Massachusetts. One of the reasons they kicked him out was because he advocated, get, get this, he advocated fair treatment for Native Americans. So they kicked him out of the colony. Amazing. I mean, just amazing. So Roger Williams, he, he founds Rhode Island based on the principle of religious freedom, and they welcome people of any religion, even if some of those beliefs seemed a little bit dangerous. Here's a couple of great quotes from, from uh, Roger Williams. He said, forced worship stinks in God's <laughs> nostrils. And he said, God is too large to be housed under one roof. This guy was, a, uh, was, was ahead of his time. One God, many paths, too big to be housed under one roof. And this brings us to a little more irony. Some of these persecuted groups, the ones that were getting exiled and kicked out and persecuted, they went on to become 
what we now know as evangelical Christians. They were the ones who enthusiastically supported this idea of putting a provision in the Bill of Rights that prevented the establishment of an official religion. Because they, of all people, knew what a really, really bad idea that would be. I think they would be appalled to learn that modern-day evangelical Christians are claiming that this is a Christian nation in order to give their religion some kind of privileged status. However, I do want to mention one very brave evangelical leader who is taking the opposite approach. There's a minister, uh, Reverend, Gary, uh, Reverend Greg Boyd, who wrote a book called The Myth of a Christian Nation. He's the pastor of a very large conservative Christian church in St. Paul, Minnesota. One of those, uh, we call them mega churches. When he started talking in church about the myth of a Christian nation, how do you think that went down? 20% of his congregation, 1,000 people headed for the doors. They left and never came back. But 80% stayed. That's what we have to focus on. The fact that the majority think it's more important to be like Jesus instead of setting him up as an idol to be worshipped and trying to make Christianity into some kind of an official religion. So despite the loud voices of a, of a minority group who want to see some sort of a Christian uh, nation or Christian imperialism happening, this country was founded as a pluralistic nation a place where people of different faiths or no faith could live together in equality and freedom and especially peace. What is it I say that we're about here at Unity of Auburn or Unity in general? We're about raising consciousness. Maybe we should be taking the, the lead in making sure that that happens. So this is going to be our theme for the rest of the month maybe with a, with a slight digression for Mother's Day. I guess, I guess we could say that, that mothers come in all shapes and sizes and religions too, right? So, <laughs> so let, let's kick things off this month by taking a look at nine ways to respect other religions. And it all starts out with educate yourself. Take it from me. I've been a Catholic, a Buddhist, and I've been a nun of the above. And I would say that unity is at the top of the chart when it comes to wanting to learn about other religions. That's why we're having this huge book sale, because boy, do we read the books and are we hungry to learn about other faiths, other religions, spirituality in general. In fact, I found this graphic, I like this one. It says, education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open one. Isn't that great? The more educated we are, the more open we are. And that's what we're about. That's a core value. The next way to respect religions is to be amazed or even converted into a better version of yourself. What this means is to allow yourself to, to have that experience of being amazed by what you learn and then let it change you. You know, it seems like religions are out to convert other people and change them. How about if we let things change us and transform us for the better? No religion has, has, has all of the truth, but most have an important piece of truth, and sometimes that piece of truth is enough to make a big change in our lives. You know, that was the dream of the people that started the unity movement. They were not to convert anyone. Their dream was that they were going to establish teachings that would help a Christian to be a better Christian, a Buddhist to be a better Buddhist, a Jewish person to be a better Jew, and so on and so forth. That was their dream, and that's what we're about. Another way is to be patient. Don't form opinions too soon. Be slow to judge. Here's what can happen when we're 
slow to judge. Of course, everybody remembers the Boston Marathon bombings last month. Something interesting happened. The people of Syria sent a message to Boston. Did anyone see this? They stood outside with this sheet, and written on the sheet is, are the words, Boston bombings represent a sorrowful scene of what happens every day in Syria. Do accept our condolences. So they reached out. They sent that message to Boston. A little while later, the people of Boston replied. Here's a bunch of Bostonians with a similar sign. It has some, some Arabic uh, letters on there, but in English it says, Friends, Syria, we too hope for the safety of your families and for peace. Love, Boston, April 20th, 2013. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing what can happen when we communicate, when we're slow to judge, and give the opportunity for something like this to happen? You know, I wish it wasn't necessary, but this kind of communication might just help to put an end to the violence. The next thing we can do is to build relationships. Now, <laughs> this can be a little bit of a challenge sure because I don't know about you all, but I have yet to find a synagogue or a mosque here in Auburn. But it does give us an opportunity to be creative and proactive because there is a Buddhist center just down the road in Penryn. There's a synagogue in Roseville. There's an Islamic center in, in Sacramento. Uh, one, of our, one of our sister unity centers that does an excellent, excellent job of establishing an interfaith dialogue and really getting into the spirit of pluralism is the Spiritual Life Center in Sacramento. That was Reverend Michael Moran's dream was to reach out and create these connections. And boy, they have the connections in Sacramento. It's a little more of a challenge for us up here. It just means we have to be a little bit more creative and a little more proactive. Um, try attending a service from another faith if they're, if they're open to that. Or at least cultivate relationships with people who may hold different beliefs. It's expanding. It's liberating. Okay, so here's another suggestion. Keep your sense of humor handy. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to remember to lighten up. Or if you're a Buddhist, you would enlighten up, right? <laughs> okay, how about this one? Did you know that Jewish people don't recognize the divinity of Jesus? Lutherans don't recognize the authority of the Pope. And Baptists don't recognize each other at the liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have to learn not to take ourselves so seriously. Sometimes people, um, I hear people say, oh, that unity is a cult. You know, and somebody comes up to me and says, oh, unity, isn't that a cult? And I like to tell them, yes, but we're the cult that cares. <laughs> uh, anyway. <clears throat> Next. And this one is so important. Ask questions. Listen. Just the opposite of what we see happening in the world, isn't it? The dominant message in the world is, I talk, you listen. Nobody wants to be a student. Nobody wants to have what the Buddhists call beginner's mind. But that's the attitude that it takes in order for real communication and dialogue to happen. And we keep coming back to this theme of communication and dialogue. Interfaith communication um, is really, I think, the only hope for the world because, and I, and I can't remember who said this, somebody famous once said that there will be no peace on earth until there is peace among the world religions. And I think that's true. I think that's true. And sometimes we have to be willing to say, I don't understand. I don't understand yet. We keep the possibility open. We keep the avenues of communication open. We keep possibility alive instead of closing the door when we hit a little bit of a rough stop spot. 
You know, I have, I have a personal mantra. My personal mantra is, I don't know. I have to remind myself that, you know, sometimes I don't know. I have to refuse to give in to the seduction of easy, certain, and often wrong answers. And just have to be in the moment and be in the question and be willing to entertain a little bit of doubt. And it's amazing how open that helps us to be so that when the answer comes or when clarification comes, we've kept the door open and we can receive it and hear it. So we say, I don't understand, yet keep the possibility alive. Another way to respect religions is to honor convictions. Don't try to remake people in your own image. Everyone has to find their own path to transformation. There's no such thing as one size fits all. We tried that in this country. We did it with Native Americans. Forced them to learn our language, to give up their faith, and to embrace our Christian faith, to wear our clothes, to go to our schools. A terrible, shameful phase of our evolution that I hope we never repeat in any form. But we have to remind ourselves that we need to be able to honor other people's convictions. We don't have to make them look like us or sound like us. And finally, and I think this is the most important one of all, it's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Every major religion has its own version of the golden rule that they arrived at separately and independently. It's almost like, again, a, a, an evolutionary force or it's something perhaps that, that's, that's part of our DNA that we get this at the deepest level of our being. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What would happen if everyone was really able to live this one simple precept. We wouldn't need any others. And I'd be out of a job. I wouldn't be able to stand up here and say, thanks for listening, and see you next week. And I will. Thank you.